Welcome to Navarro Live. I'm Michael Walker. And this evening, I'm joined by James Meadway. James, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I am very well. I've got a, a fan pointed at my face, which apparently is quiet enough that it doesn't go and interfere in the microphone. So I'm very grateful for that. I'm looking on the bright side today. This morning, junior doctors began a 72-hour strike. It's the third wave of strike action this year from England's 47,000 junior doctors after they rejected a 5% pay offer from the government. The BMA say that junior doctors have suffered a 26% real terms erosion in pay since 2008. And to restore it back to that level, they want a pay rise of 35%, so very different from the 5% they've been offered. Now that 35% might sound high, but Dr. Vivek Trivedi from the BMA explained to the BBC it wouldn't all need to come at once. A fair settlement would just be fair pay for doctors. We've lost more than 20%, more than 26% of our pay in real terms over the last 15 years. And that didn't happen overnight. And we're not looking for it to be fixed and reversed overnight. But we need to do something to stop doctors from leaving because Real, real terms, pay cut after pay cut, year on year, is sending a signal to doctors that they're not valued and not appreciated, and it's literally driving doctors away, which is something we need to stop. Can I just pick up for a moment on what you just said there? Because I think that is really interesting. So you're looking for a fair settlement. You haven't mentioned a number. Um, and you're looking for fair pay for doctors and for that to not be fixed overnight. What exactly do you mean by that? Well, it's clear. So we're looking to fully restore our pay back to 2008 level. So not a pay rise, just to go back to neutral. And we were looking at uh, deals with the government when we were negotiating with them a month or so ago. And that deals could span over a number of years, which we were happy to entertain and want to. But when the government put back an offer of, of 5% and refused to go past that, when inflation is more than 10% at the moment, and that would mean it's another real terms pay cut this year alone, it shows one of two things. They either don't understand the impact of continued pay erosion on the workforce, on morale and retention, or they do understand, but they simply don't care. That all sounds reasonable enough. Um, the Health Secretary, Steve Barclay, disagrees, though. We moved in terms of the government's position in line with the offer that was accepted by the NHS Staff Council and by trade unions representing a number of other health workers and made an offer in line with that. But unfortunately, the junior doctors have refused to move from their demand for 35%. Uh, they're still insisting on an increase of 35%. I think for many of your viewers, that is out of step with what they themselves are receiving. And we need to balance the demands of the NHS with also getting inflation down uh, and growing the economy. Now, given that interview was after the one we just showed you with the representative from the BMA, that seems pretty dishonest, right? So the BMA, or the junior doctors sort of division of the BMA being very clear, um, in principle, what they want is pay restoration, but they're not expecting a 35% pay deal next year, right? They're happy to meet in the middle. 5% is not meeting in the middle. That's what they've been offered. Um, of course, caught in the middle of this battle is patience. Um, so the battle between the NHS workforce and governments is patience. Steve Powis is NHS England's National Medical Director. We're about to have another three days of industrial action from junior doctors. We've seen industrial action in the NHS since December uh, of last year. This is the third time the junior doctors have been on strike. Uh, so our main job at NHS England is to ensure that we plan for that. Uh, consultants mostly will be covering other staff to supporting. Uh, we're keeping emergency services uh, as normal, safe, uh, maternity services, trauma. But of course, as you've also said, there will be a lot of disruption to regular care. So last time round, four day strike, just under 200,000 appointments were disrupted, 50,000 a day. So I expect we'll see similar levels of disruption uh, this time round. So we've heard from doctors from NHS bosses and from the government. But what about Labour's stance? Speaking to the BBC this morning, Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting said this. State of the public finances as they are, and I fear um, for what an incoming Labour government might inherit uh, should we win the next general election. I've said to the junior docs, I can't honestly say we'd be able to deliver a 35% pay increase overnight. I totally understand their argument. They're right to say factually that pay hasn't kept up in line with inflation. With the cost of living as it is, I understand that junior doctors in particular are feeling the pain in their pockets. And there's also a risk for the NHS, actually, that the government, I think, needs to take seriously, which is that these very bright, very capable uh, people at the start of their careers in the NHS don't just walk out for a few days, but walk out altogether. And I think the best thing the Prime Minister could do today 
given we've already lost more than half a million appointments to delays and cancellations, would be to get around the table uh, and negotiate with them. Because I, th I think it's not an unwillingness of the junior doctors to negotiate, it's the unavailability of a table from the government. So Labour won't be drawn on what they would pay doctors were they in power. And reluctant to commit to any new funding, Streeting suggested artificial intelligence could help save the NHS on the cheap. Take breast cancer diagnosis, for example. If we use AI that already exists in the diagnosis of breast cancer scans, we can free up, free up about 30% of radiologists' capacity to do more work um, because they'll be able to use the technology to save them time. And it improves... Um, breast cancer diagnoses by about 16%. So women get access to more accurate diagnoses. I mean, that's a game changer in terms of freeing up precious staff time and improving outcomes for patients. People will hear that and say, we can't even sort out a computerized patient record system. Mm. How the heck are we gonna be able to sort out AI in the NHS? Well, I mean, I was, I was spent yesterday morning um, with the shadow cabinet at Google's headquarters, talking to them about a range of possibilities um, right across the economy and in our public services. I'm, I'm constantly inundated with really smart technologists that are building new treatments and new technologies here in Britain who are so frustrated because they knock on the door of the NHS and they find no one's home. Um, there's loads of stuff we can, in a practical way, do to get better value for taxpayers and also better outcomes for patients, which is the most important thing, especially when money's tight and there isn't a lot of money washing around for public service spending increases. That's what they're always looking for, desperate to say we can improve the service without giving it more money. And we'll be speaking in a moment about whether that's possible. Um, I'm joined now by Dr. Carmel McClelland, a junior doctor working in emergency medicine and public health. Thank you so much for joining us. Can we start on this disruption issue? I mean, I know, I, I know junior doctors care a lot about patients' health. Um, so uh, how are you seeing this? How, how disruptive will these strikes be for patients? We don't want to strike. You know, this is, this is a last ditch resort. Um, this is our attempt at kind of raising the alarm at what is happening within our health service. And yes, there will be some disruption. Um, we will ensure that uh, patients are safe and uh, that emergency care will happen. However, um, this is, you know, what we've been led to uh, with the government's refusal to negotiate with us. You heard in one of those earlier clips from the representative from the BMA, they were saying, we want pay restoration, but we don't necessarily need it right now, so long as there is some sort of roadmap by which we would get back up to the pay we had in, in 2008, we'd be happy. I mean, is that a position you share? And I suppose, if so, what kind of timescale would, would we be talking here? Would you want pay restoration within two years, three years, five years? What are you, what are you thinking on this one? I think we just need like a clear roadmap about um, what's, what's happening in terms of pay. And I mean, not only is, um, is the pay restoration ask what, you know, what is fair and reasonable, because we're just, as, as you've said, restoring our pay to where it was 15 years ago. But, you know, I have so many friends who are leaving the NHS or going abroad. So this is actually, you know, something that needs, this is absolutely necessary that needs to happen. And so it's, it's not, you know, we, you can kind of look at the weeds of what the specific aspects of the negotiations, but what we really need is a, a, a commitment and a plan of, um, you know, improving doctors and all health workers pay and conditions so that we don't continue seeing highly skilled, highly valuable healthcare workers leaving our health service. So somewhat separately from the strike, I know the NHS is currently, you know, well, it's, it seems to be in an endless crisis, but it's still recovering from COVID and sort of the backlogs there. I mean, can you talk to us a bit about what it's like working in the NHS at the moment? I know you're in emergency medicine and public health, so two very relevant sort of sides of, of the health service when it comes from, say, the COVID recovery. What, what are you, what's your read on that at the moment? Staff morale is exceptionally low. Um, the, the NHS has, uh, particularly over the last 10 years, run quite heavily on the goodwill of staff. Um, but with, you know, with COVID and the, the stress and, um, you know, heartache that that brought, and then this continued pay erosion, a lot of this goodwill amongst doctors and other healthcare staff is just not really there anymore. And, and so it's, it's a very desperate situation. And, you know, I just look back to when I was working during COVID and, um, you know, at the, at the height of one of the new variant outbreaks, you know, half the staff would be 
off sick, the patient load would be twice as much. And that's kind of, I think all doctors have some kind of experience like that and are extremely fearful about what that would mean if that became a new normal, you know, there would be so much avoidable harm and death that would happen. And again, this is, this is entirely avo avoidable. This is, a, a, you know, a deliberate policy choice by our current government. Um, and yeah, our, our NHS is really a risk if, if this pay restoration does not come into place. And I want to talk to you about Wes Streeting's comments. So I suppose on the one hand, he's saying, look, we recognise where you're coming from, um, but we in opposition, we're not willing to say, yeah, we would restore your pay within X number of years because they're worried the Tories are going to say, well, then you'll have to borrow this much money and they don't want to raise taxes, right? So there's that on one side. There's also this AI issue. So Labour is sort of saying, we don't need to spend that much more money to fix the problems. All we need to do is be smart with new technology. Could I get you to comment on, I suppose, both of those points from, from the current Labour leadership? First, on the kind of economic argument that Wes Streeting was making about how, you know, a Labour government wouldn't be able to afford it or there would need to be kind of, it would need to be spread out over a number of years. And, you know, obviously junior doctors are open to negotiation about a roadmap of implementing this pay restoration. However, first of all, you know, money always seems to be found uh, somewhere for, you know, for new military spending, for, um, you know, we saw it during PPE, how money was spent left, right and centre. So money can be found. And, and also, you know, properly funding the NHS means people are, are happier, healthier and more productive within the economy. And so there are so many co-benefits to the economy at large for, to actually uh, funding the NHS properly. Then regarding the, the AI solution, I mean, I think, I think every doctor would find this completely laughable, to be honest. Um, you know, we, we, we currently, you know, it's, it's hard to find a computer that works on our wards or it takes 15 minutes to load up the, the kind of software that we need. There are corridors filled with um, broken equipment where there's no funding to fix it. So to, to think that AI is the solution is just kind of completely laughable. And for me, it's, it's a distraction from actually, you know, proper discussions about how we're going to, you know, rebuild uh, hospitals that are falling apart um, properly, you know, fund um, different aspects of the health service, including improving both doctors and all health workers pay and conditions. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, um, yeah, not, not, not a real solution. So I suppose, I mean, one thing that speaks to, I, I keep reading that one of the big problems with the NHS, so I see these graphs that say, actually, there, there are quite a lot of staff at the moment. Yeah, they've got very low morale, which is a real problem. But where the NHS has been completely starved over recent years is in capital spending and in terms of equipment. And I think compared to sort of comparable countries, we have, for example, way, way fewer MRI machines. So it's much harder to be a, a good, effective doctor because everything's falling apart around you. Yeah, do you think we should be making a bigger deal out of this, a bigger deal out of, sort of the physical equipment that's in hospitals and how it needs to be a bit better and we should probably buy more of it? Yeah, I, I think so. You know, you, you look at other um, kind of high income countries, you know, supposedly we're a very wealthy country. However, you look at our health service where, you know, the number of wards I've worked on where the roof is leaking if it rains, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, so, it's so absurd to think about. Um, yeah, we, we have to really kind of tackle these more, first of all, you know, these bread and butter simple issues, you know, looking at the, the estates, the, um, the equipment, all of these things. And then, yeah, if we want to explore AI to make certain aspects of, of our health service more efficient, then sure. But, you know, I think they're doing it completely the wrong way around. Carmen McLennan, thank you so much for joining us today. Solidarity to you and your colleagues out on strike. Because we've mentioned AI, I couldn't resist getting James Meadway's thoughts on these. We, we, I want it to become a habit whenever I get you on for us to talk about artificial intelligence, one of the big topics of the day. Do you think it can save us money in the NHS? Is Wes Streeting being sensible? Uh, well, look, I mean, I think what Camel said on you've got to get the basics right is the starting point in this. The King's Fund, the health charity, estimates that there's a nearly £10 billion repair backlog 
in the NHS, right? That's not getting new equipment. That's making sure that hospital roofs aren't leaking. Ten billion pounds needs to be found for that because the government hasn't spent the money on it for such a long period of time. So you need to get that, and that's going to cost money. And that's really basic stuff on a large scale across the whole estate of the NHS before you can think about really artificial intelligence and all the rest of it. Now, look, West Streeting does have a. He's, he's not sort of wrong here. There's lots of uses that you can get out of machine learning, artificial intelligence, particularly around diagnostics. Uh, Wes mentioned one himself. You can get a you know, kind of AI that can check very quickly and effectively for cataracts now, this sort of thing. That actually is there. And at least in principle, you could make our medical treatment, our NHS work better because of that. But the bit that I think Wes doesn't really talk about uh, and that uh, perhaps we all need to have a bit of an eye on is not just whether or not, and Cam's right about this, by the way, the, the sort of IT disasters that have happened in the NHS over the last sort of 20 years are notorious. But let's say that, okay, you go off to Google or you go off to Palantir or you go off to one of these big tech companies and say, oh, yes, well, you can uh, now install this wonderful new artificial intelligence enabled, machine learning enabled diagnost diagnostics tool, and you can do that and we can get it really cheap because you can take our data. And that's the bit that I think we need to keep an eye on. The NHS data set, all our patient records, all that sort of thing is usually reckoned to be one of the most valuable on the planet because it's very big. It covers basically the whole population and it's really trustworthy and reliable. It's very, very accurate. It's wildly valuable. These companies want to get their hands in it. And if we're not careful, what looks like a nice, cheap solution, oh, look, here comes Palantir, and they are very kindly going to, for instance, help manage the logistics on the vaccine rollout, which is what they were doing during COVID. And they do that, and it seems to be very cheap, and it seems to be a reasonable deal, but actually it's a data grab operation, and we lose out if that happens. That, I think, is a bit that we need to keep a, a much closer eye on what's happening here. I suppose another thing we disagree on is how concerned we are about data. So let's 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 go with this, James. Is that not a, is that not a reasonable trade? Say so you could have some of the NHS's data if you provide a decent yeah. IT service. Obviously, the NHS isn't very good at doing it itself. It's sort of proven in the past. So if they say you can have some data which might improve yeah. your advertising on Instagram, um, and in return you can make us an AI system that works, is that not maybe a win-win? It could be, but the, the problem we've got is that that isn't the, the kind of discussion we're having. I mean, look, we've gone through this in the last 15, 20 years or so, that, that we all sort of lurch into using Facebook or whatever, and then a bit down the line realize that actually there's a kind of data grab operation taking place that no one really knew was there and what the impacts of it would be. And it would be good to have a proper conversation. Look, if that's the plan and we can agree on that, and there's a party elected that says, this is how we're going to make the NHS work really well, this is what we're going to present to you, I'm fine with that. Let's have that discussion. But we're not. If we're just like we're streeting an interview saying, oh, well, we can save money because, you know, AI and stuff and don't, don't question the details too much. It's, you know, it's just kind of there. Or he's been had Google or whoever because he mentioned Google, uh, you know, being very persuasive about what they can do and basically lobbying to get access to this. That's a different thing to having a proper public conversation about what the NHS is going to be like in the future. I'm fine with that. And if we collectively decide, OK, fine. We, under these circumstances, with these controls in place, this is the data that we're happy being used to get this advantage of the technology over here. We can do that. Well, some NHS trusts, some GP surgeries are already trying to implement this. I'm thinking of you know, Tower Hamlets, for example, where something like this is being put in place. You can, you can make this happen. You can have a negotiation. But you need to have the negotiation, not hand-waving from the Shadow Health Secretary about it's all okay, AI is going to turn up and make everything great for us. No, that's smart. I agree with that. And I suppose also... You know, if if what this is about is a bit of a negotiation, the last thing you want to do is turn up at Google and say, we're completely broke. Um, can you please help us? Because that is how you end up with a situation where you're giving away a lot of data and not getting that much in return. So really what you want to do is say, we're we're in a very strong position. Um, you're also in a strong position. Obviously, Google is strong. NHS is strong. Let's come together and work out something which is mutually beneficial. Saying we're desperate, please help us, is not the way to get a good deal, which is basically what what Wes Streeting is saying that we might want to do it ourselves, but we can't possibly afford it. So help us, please. It's not how you get a good deal. British mortgage holders are already struggling. And if Chancellor Jeremy Hunt has his way, interest rates will keep going higher. We understand that there is real pressure on families with mortgages, on businesses with loans as interest rates go up. And that's why we're giving over £3,000 of help to every family up and down the country on average this year and last. So we're doing what we can to help people through a difficult patch. But in the end, there is no alternative to bringing down inflation if we want to see consumers spending, if we want to see businesses investing, if we want to see long-term growth and prosperity. 
And that's why we will be unstinting in our support for the Bank of England as they go about their job to bring down inflation. That warning about higher interest rates comes as the UK continues to experience higher inflation than other G7 countries. And that seems to be having an effect on the cost of government borrowing. So this chart shows the interest charged on two-year government bonds. That first spike, you can see, was the consequences of Liz Truss's mini-budget. That's what caused her downfall and a huge political crisis. But now, as you can see, there's a second spike there. And borrowing, or government borrowing, is even more expensive than it was back then. So that interest rate on two-year bonds, 4.8%, under Liz Truss, brought down a government. We're now seeing it again, but it doesn't seem too big a deal. James, what's going on here? Why did interest rates on two-year government bonds going up to 4.8% bring down the Liz Trust government, but now we're seeing them again? And you know, presumably some people are noticing in their mortgage rates, but it's not a political crisis in the same way that that one was. Well, the issue with Liz Trust is just how, and you can see on the graph, is just how rapidly uh, interest rates on government bonds shot up. And, and that set off a whole load of uh, consequences, most important one of which was, was the way the pension funds at the time actually still have quite complicated ways to manage the money that's placed in them that depend crucially on government bonds not uh, rates not moving very much, right? And these are all t immediately walloped by that big spike. So there was a real risk over the weekend after the budget that pension funds would be insolvent so people wouldn't get their pensions paid out. So that was the kind of political crisis we got out of that. It, it's, it's easier to manage when there's been a run-up to it. It's still, as you pointed out, unpleasant if you have a mortgage, for example, or you're looking to get a mortgage. It, it's still not good. It's not great for the government itself. I mean, this is the, the incredible thing. We had a decade of like the lowest interest rates in human history. And what did our government do with this? Did it go out and invest, borrow money, uh, build HS2, build you know new houses, uh, invest in education, build loads of new hospitals? No, of course not. It just did austerity. It didn't do any of these things. It didn't make use of those interest rates. And now they've gone. And we've got much higher interest rates for government borrowing and, of course, much higher, higher inflation at the same time. The Labour Party keeps saying it's these increased interest rates that mean they have to be particularly careful when it comes to borrowing money. I mean, is there is there something to that? I mean, obviously, you know, it, it would be easier to to borrow to do a green industrial revolution if interest rates were at two percent, or borrowing, you know, interest rates on government borrowing was two percent instead of the five percent it is now. So, do they have a point? Basically, if you just look at it and say, okay, interest rates have gone up, what's the plan? What are they going to look like in the future? Now, people who speculate in these things, if you look at what the markets are telling us, they say that interest rates are going to carry on rising. They've been like 6% or something coming into, into next year. Um, so, so that is a genuine problem if you're a government and you're looking to borrow because it's a bit more expensive, a lot more expensive than it used to be. Now, if you take the total amount of government borrowing, what you're really going to spend on this relative to the total government budget, it's still a long way below the amount of borrowing, the amount you'd have to spend relative to your whole budget is still actually not that big. The bit you might also want to throw in, and this is where Labour have, I think, been completely negligent, and that's being quite kind in this, is to say, oh no, absolutely no consideration of tax rises on the wealthy, for, in for instance. That's just been ruled out. So some of the really obvious ones, equalising capital gains tax and income tax, probably brings in around £16 billion a year, hits the wealthiest. They're the people who pay, pay uh, capital gains tax overwhelmingly. Uh, just ruled out. So you're not going to do that. No consideration of wealth taxes and the hundreds of billions uh, that could potentially be brought in from this. So, so they've really made life unnecessarily difficult for themselves and prioritise uh, the wrong thing at this point. Not actually investing to make the economy work. Because like, why is it that Britain's in a worse situation than other similar economies? It's in a worse situation because we haven't had an investment for uh, you know, decades, really. We don't have uh, those well-paid jobs that you might want to create if you're going to do a big uh, green prosperity plan that's actually backed up by serious amounts of, of spending. We don't have these things. It is a low productivity economy. So, of course, it just gets more and more expensive as you go on, harder and harder to do things. The only way out of that or at least your first thing you're going to have to do on that is you are going to have to spend some money and invest that money in repairing and making our public transport system work and installing all the, that renewable power that we're going to need. You're going to have to spend money in this. You can't do it on the cheap. And that's the bit that Labour just doesn't seem to grasp. And as things stand, if they're not going to do that to the scale we need, and all the signalling right now says they're not, we are not going to repair the economy just as a starting point. You can't do this on the cheap. Interest rates at, say, 5%, it seems high compared to the last decade, but yeah. for the rest of the 20th century, it was usually higher. Okay. So if you look at the whole noughties up until 2008, which were you know, 
decent for economic growth. It was always hovering at around five. So d- do we want to end up at a situation where we can have 5% interest rates and people don't go bankrupt because they've bought over? It, it, I suppose to rephrase this question, is the problem 5% interest rates or is the problem that people massively bought overvalued homes because interest rates were so low and this is just a transition problem and that actually we should just help people through the transition and accept that interest rates at 5% isn't actually a bad thing? The interest rate that really matters is the difference between what your interest rate is and, uh, and what, in, what inflation is doing and what inflation is going to do in the future. And then also how much money in terms of income, how much you're being paid to cope with interest rates that are higher. Because you're absolutely right. You know, we had an unusual period of very, very exceptionally low interest rates over the last decade or so. Broadly, interest rates have actually been coming down across the developed world for the last sort of 40 years or so. If you take quite a long view on this, we are quite likely to be at a turning point in that. I mean, that that seems speculative, but it seems quite likely that we're going to be looking at higher interest rates going going into the future, not least because you have central banks all over the world who look at inflation going up. Inflation is not really going to come down that much and therefore drive up their interest rates, which starts to affect uh, the cost of borrowing um, for everybody else. So, So there is this transitional problem, exactly as you say. The difficulty that we have is that when you have a low productivity, basically low income, you know, rich for some people, but low income for loads and loads of other people economy, you end up with lots and lots of debt being built up, often usually attached to houses, not necessarily. There's lots of credit card debt that's been built up for a long period of time. There's all sorts of other borrowing that people have got into. To, and that's because people are compensating the fact that their actual earnings aren't particularly high. And then, of course, you try to live somewhere when you know, house prices due to various kinds of speculation, the impacts of quantitative easing, lots of money rushing into the property market, even though most people aren't really being paid that much uh, by comparison. That's a, a big weight that's bearing down you now. So you've stacked all these problems up, the big debts, the rising interest rates, on top of this really rickety economy at the bottom that's kind of not very productive, doesn't pay people enough money, quite good at sending lots of cash to the top of society, doesn't do much for the rest of us. And now it's being subject to this big shock around interest rates. So so it doesn't bode well for Britain, like none of this does at this point in time. I want to go to a comment over on Twitch. Derpfee says, whenever an economist talks about the need to increase interest rates to keep inflation down, what they're saying is that higher unemployment and house repossession rates are a price worth paying to maintain asset growth. My layman's theory here, I want to throw this to you, James. I've, it seems to me that sort of the bind that central banks are in is they want to raise interest rates to increase unemployment, but they're actually quite worried about increasing repossession rates because that would, that would actually lower asset prices. So I feel like they, they want to hit workers, but not homeowners. Am I, am I on to something there? There's something to this. There's a basic problem with like how a central bank operates. Historically, these things are set up to, to look after banks and to try and preserve financial stability. And then in the last few decades, we've also said, oh, well, you can look after inflation as well by fiddling around with the interest rate. Now, the problem you've got is that if a central bank says, oh, inflation is really high, we better put up interest rates. And then actually inflation doesn't come down particularly because it's not going to because the interest rate isn't going to affect, <laughs> isn't going to affect the kinds of inflation we got. You know, it's the after effects of COVID. It's the Ukraine war. It's uh, ongoing environmental calamities of various sorts. Interest rate doesn't do anything with that. But it does start to affect financial stability because if you saw, if you remember back in the US in a few months ago, because you had loads of banks, smaller banks that are all tied up uh, in the belief that interest rates would be low forever, had lots of speculative investments started to fail. This is what happened to Silicon Valley Bank. So in other words, you, central bank, trying to put up interest rates to chase inflation and failing, because it's not going to have that impact, uh, are actually just setting off financial crises uh, over here instead. So there's a real clash, right? That's, a, that's an institutional failure. This whole thing's an institutional failure. There's, there's no way that changing the interest rate here sort of what ends the war in Ukraine or uh, stops El Nino, which is going to you know, drive up uh, commodity prices and therefore inflation across the world over this summer. It, it doesn't make more olives grow in Spain to bring down the price of olive oil. Right? It doesn't happen if you change the interest rate. So they've got one tool, kind of one tool, and it's basically useless right now. Our show is powered by you, our viewers. And if you want to support independent media, then you can do so at navaramedia.com slash support. That link is in the description box below. Back in January, Shadow Education Secretary Bridget Phillipson gave an interview to the Sunday Times. The topic was childcare, and Phillipson certainly tried to come across as staking out a pretty radical pitch. 
the paper reported that her plan was to guarantee childcare for all parents of children aged nine months to 11 years. In that interview, Philipson also said this, despite the fact we spend an awful lot of money as a country on childcare, it is fragmented. Providers are closing and childcare is becoming less and less accessible, which is why I believe we need to completely rethink how we deliver childcare. We need to move towards a modern system that runs from the end of parental leave right through to the end of primary school. The paper went on to say this. She added that she wants to make a change in education like the change that we saw post-1945 with the creation of the NHS. That's the scale and ambition that we have. Now, you can't throw around the word NHS without people thinking free at the point of delivery. So it's a nationalised education system where you have care from cradle, I suppose not till the grave, but till graduation from university, let's say. So it's not surprising um, that that article got people's hopes up when it came to something along the lines of universal childcare. But it turns out that now Labour's plans aren't quite as bold. This headline, six months later, is from The Guardian. So Labour rules out universal childcare for young children in fiscal credibility drive. The paper goes on to report this. Instead of offering free or very cheap childcare to every family with a child over nine months old, Labour is looking at giving more support for poorer families while tapering it off for those on higher incomes. A Labour spokesperson said, quote, an expansion of childcare to all children is not Labour's policy. Last year, Labour announced that as part of its plan to modernise childcare, that we will deliver free breakfast clubs for all primary school pupils in England, paid for by closing the non-DOM tax loophole and allowing councils to offer more childcare provision where they are able to do so. So why are Labour looking to bring in means testing? Well, at the moment, um, families who earn under £100,000 a year year qualify for up to 30 hours free childcare per week during term time, but only for children between three and four years old. If you're going back to work after maybe 39 weeks maternity leave, that leaves a long time without free childcare. The Guardian goes on to say this, party sources say that they are keen to eliminate the gap that exists between the end of parental leave and when a child turns free and qualifies for the free hours program. One of the most effective ways to do this would be to increase means testing, say. Of course, scaling back the ambition on childcare is a result of Labour's commitment to their fiscal rules. But if Labour want to create economic growth, childcare is going to be crucial to that. That's something Philipson herself recognised back in October last year. Is the long-term plan to have a state-run early education system like many other European countries? Uh, well, I'm off to Estonia next week, actually, to look at how other countries are doing some of that, mm. because I don't think we've got all the answers here, and I don't think we've got it right at the moment. We spend an awful lot of money as a country on a system that is still very expensive for parents, that doesn't provide staff working in that you know, vital part of um, a vital industry, that vital part of our economy, with actually the, the proper pay in terms and conditions that they deserve. So that's got to be an important part of it too. But this is a real priority for me. I don't think you can talk about growing your economy unless you've got a real plan about how you provide parents with the support that they need uh, around childcare. It's hard to overstate how expensive and how difficult the childcare sector in England is to navigate right now. According to charity Karam, the average annual full-time cost of childcare for a two-year-old stands at a whopping £15,000. And even when a child reaches the age of three, the money offered by the state isn't enough to cover the costs of providers, meaning that, according to Ofsted, we're losing around 7% of childminders per year. James, what do you make of this shift from the Labour Party? They sort of promised something which they implied that something quite ambitious was coming. Um, and the reality seems to be a fair bit more disappointing. There's so many bad things about this. I mean, look, exactly as you said, the, the, and actually Bridget Phillipson says, and frankly, talk to it to anyone who has small children, like the costs of childcare uh, and the, the way in which provision is so sort of overstretched absolutely everywhere. Uh, it's just it's completely dysfunctional as far as the system goes. And you can go to almost any other European country and find that things just work better there. So you know, Estonia, look across the Scandinavia, you can find much, much better versions of making this happen. What seemed to be the promise from Bridget Philipson was that this would be the kind of system we'd be moving towards. This would be the gold standard, something like Scandinavian provision, and we'd move towards that. And particularly if you throw in exactly as he said, the NHS, this sets in people's heads, that's what it's going to be. 
by walking back from this, it is yet another version of that classic thing with the Starmer leadership, where there's some big promise, and then you step back and step back and step back. And by the time you get at the end, is this little squeak uh, of an offer of some sort that, that you end up on this side. This seems particularly squeaky, by the way, the point at which you introduce means testing. I mean, this is a way to really sort of start to undermine a system. Why is the NHS popular? Because it's universal. Everyone can get it, so everyone's got a stake in it. As soon as you introduce means testing like this into a system, you undermine the support and the public support and the credibility of the system. You start to seriously... Uh, chisel away at the offer you're trying to make and, and you start to create a political atmosphere in which that thing will be lost. That's one problem with it. The other one is that bluntly on this, I think they've also been somewhat outmaneuvered by the Tories. Because if you think back to the budget back in what March this year, where Jeremy Hunt's sudden rabbit out of the hat rather, was like, here's a load of money uh, for uh, childcare spending. Now, there are all sorts of problems, as you might anticipate, with that relatively big increase in funding. For instance, the, the additional support for childcare doesn't actually come in until like 2025 or thereabouts. Uh, it's short of what you need to pay people properly in the sector with this increase in support that's being promised. But nonetheless, it sort of closes down what Labour, I guess, thought was otherwise a fairly easy space for them, which is to go into childcare, promise something, and it's kind of better than the Tories, whatever you end up doing. And now they got to this bad situation where, okay, they have their own you know, fiscal rules, which are always rather hazy about. So God knows what the real content of these things is. Uh, their own fiscal rules they're trying to meet. Uh, no talk about raising taxes to pay for any of this stuff. And therefore, the Tories have occupied your political space and you just end up with this kind of like, oh, well, it's just going to be a means testing. Maybe you'll get a voucher for a nursery or something. God knows what. It's just, it's just a bad, bad politics. And it's bad economics for all the reasons that people have pointed out. Like not having good childcare basically means you have less women participating, able to go out to work, right? That's one of the obvious impacts of this sort of thing. It just doesn't work on every possible level. It's something obvious to try and sort out. And by walking back from it, they're setting up a bad political argument because the Tories can say they're doing something in this and what's Labour got as a response? A bit of means testing, okay. Uh, that They've offered a pledge that they're now saying they're not really going to meet. So they create an expectation to walk back from it. And of course, on the economic side, it just doesn't make sense for the long term to do this. I'm interested in this idea of like universalism because the argument that's always put forward by the left, and I think it is very persuasive, is that when you, when you make a service universal, you will have widespread support for it for, because everyone uses it. So if you, if you have this this service or this this provision, which is only for very poor people, then you're giving a support base to this policy, which is only um, people who are have very little political power, right? So that's why it's easier to sort of get rid of, um, you know, universal credit or whatever. Or I mean, they've got universal credit, but easier to get rid of certain benefits that sort of the new Labour government's built up, say working tax credits. But it's quite difficult to attack the NHS, because the NHS is universal, and there's actually a powerful constituency defending it. At the same time, I I do feel like maybe with the NHS, one of the reasons it's not as consistently funded as in other countries is because rich people do actually want to spend more money on their health than they're willing to spend in taxes. And so you can actually get a system whereby rich people, by spending all that money, end up making the system a bit have more money in it, right? So looking at Germany or France or whatever, where you've got this social insurance system, people are very willing to pay for actually very expensive health insurance. And as long as it's state backed and sort of within this integrated system, then I feel like you can actually have quite a well funded system, which is universal without it being on the model of the NHS, because rich people will spend more money on it. And, and the worst thing you want is a two tier system whereby you've got this shitty childcare that the state is providing, which is underfunded because it's being taxpayer funded. And then rich people, they have a completely separate private system, which is, you know, next door to it. I and mean, what do you make of that? Do you, do you think a sort of NHS model is the only way to do universal provision of childcare? Well, we can, we can go around and, and devise different uh, models for this. It was the promise under under Corbyn that there, you know, there'd be a national care service, which is you know, a phrase presumably Bridget Phillipson isn't going to say, but she's sort of gesticulating uh, in, in that direction. I mean, the, the challenge with the, the universality or doing, as you say, a sort of social insurance version of this is in two parts. One is the they're kind of building in a level of inequality into the system that, that you start to get through this sort of thing. The other one is the efficiency. I mean, the NHS is underfunded, but it remains a very efficient model of uh, very efficient model of healthcare provision relative to many, many other alternatives in other developed economies because it is universal. So you get the economies of scale, for instance. You can do everything on a really big scale. You have the government able to buy cheap drugs because it's a really big buyer of drugs. So you have that uh, universality, the scale, and you get a more efficient uh, system out the other end. The problem with the NHS, of course, is that 
you know, we kind of exploit that efficiency in addition to the goodwill of the staff and consistently just underfund the thing relative to, to where it could be. In the case of, of, of childcare especially, the, the solid argument for universalism on this, I think, is the one that, well, the Women's Budget Group, for example, have done some very good work around the economic consequences of just giving really good comprehensive coverage to everybody who wants it, which is that you, you have a lot more people who can go out to work because of this. You have a lot the you know, households with a lot more money that they can spend. I mean, that kind of keeps the economy ticking over. And you can provide a very solid basis for, well, obviously, for children, you know, having very, very good quality care. You then go and somewhere down the line, you will find much, much better outcomes but for those children in particular. All of this starts to stack up into actually a pretty robust economic argument. Never mind the sort of social justice, or actually, we just want to look after kids properly. It's a pretty decent reason to do some of this stuff. You actually get a pretty solid economic case of getting really good universal childcare provision by the state that's guaranteed to everybody. And you try and find the most efficient, effective way of doing that. It's probably going to be something like the tax system and rich people pay more in taxes and everybody else can get the benefit out of that. The city of Nottingham has been shaken by the killing of three of its residents. In the early hours of Tuesday morning, a man with a knife stabbed two Nottingham University students returning from an end of term night out. Barnaby Webber was just 19 years old and finishing his first year as a history student, described by his family as a beautiful, brilliant, bright young man with everything in life to look forward to. He was a keen cricketer who'd just made the university team. Grace Kumar was also only 19 years old. She was a talented hockey player who'd competed in England's under-18 squad. Studying medicine at Nottingham, her family described her as an adored daughter and sister. They said she was a truly wonderful and beautiful young woman. Sometime after those senseless crimes, the alleged perpetrator attacked another man in his 60s, killing him as well. Ian Coates was the caretaker of Huntington Academy, whose head teacher described him as, quote, a much-loved colleague who always went the extra mile for the benefit of our children and will be greatly missed. After stabbing Mr Coates, the alleged perpetrator stole his van before running over another three people. Those three are being treated for their injuries in hospital. One is in a critical condition. Naturally, the community is in shock. More than 2,000 people have attended a vigil at the University of Nottingham. They laid flowers and held a minute's silence for the victims. Shortly after the attacks, a suspect was arrested on suspicion of murder. He hasn't been named, but he's understood to be 31 years old and originally from West Africa. Official sources confirmed to the BBC that he has settled status after living in the UK since his teens. The BBC also reports that he has no criminal record and was not known to the security services, but that he did have a history of mental illness. The police investigation is still ongoing. Now, it looks like a terrible and, and tragic event. Normally, we wouldn't report on stories like this because horrific as they are, um, they generally aren't particularly political. And it's important not to speculate while the facts are still unclear as to what exactly has gone on here. Um, that's, in fact, a sentiment that Home Secretary Suella Braverman appeared to agree with when she gave this statement to the House of Commons. I'm being kept fully informed by law enforcement on the ground and receiving regular updates. Mr Speaker, the House will appreciate the critical importance of following due process at all times. It's completely natural to seek answers immediately when something terrible happens, but it's also vital that those answers are wholly accurate. Speculating out loud is never helpful and runs the risk of being counterproductive. The police have asked for patience while the inquiries continue, Mr Speaker. Unfortunately, someone who didn't get Braverman's memo is her colleague Ben Bradley. He's Tory MP for Mansfield, so that's near Nottingham. And the reason I say this is because hours earlier, he'd been busy giving an interview to Talk TV's Julia Hartley Brewer. That's when he made these grim events political. Many people are making the point that as soon as it's sort of not ruled out completely, but it's thought to be not terrorism, the attention seems to go away. Mental health problem, foreign national, oh well, nothing to see here. That's just not how most British people see it. Uh, no, I don't think it will be. I mean, the first thing I, I'll say, of course, is it's absolutely devastating for the city uh, and the residents uh, of Nottinghamshire who, um, you know, feel and felt like Nottingham was a safe place to be, is a warm, welcoming place. And um, it is a worry, as you just described, and, you know, particularly a huge student population in Nottingham, um, lots of parents with children living away from home for the first time and, and all of those challenges. So, um it's been an awful 24 hours. Um, the city's come together, uh, the community's come together, there were vigils and, and um, 
uh, kind of people putting their arms around each other last night, really, and, and hopefully I'm sure that will continue for the next um, coming days and, and we'll try to recover and support people. But it, it is a fair point, and you, you won't be surprised at my view, Julia, that being in Britain is a privilege, not a right, um, and that actually if that is abused, then you shouldn't be here. Now, that is an important conversation. I agree with a lot of frustrations that have been raised. Uh, I do think that if, you have, uh, if you're not a British citizen, you commit particularly violent crimes in this country, you shouldn't be here. Yeah. Um, I also think that's an, uh, an important debate for us to have away from the heat of this particular circumstance. So he says it's an important debate to have away from the heat of these circumstances after you know, intimating towards it on, on national radio. And then Bradley didn't let the heat of these particular circumstances stop him going further. A lot of people will say, look, be very sympathetic uh, and, and someone may have issues. But but there's also an argument where, look, we, you know, we've got enough criminals of our own. We've got enough terrorists of our own. We've got enough people with serious mental illness who could be a risk to people. Although, by the way, lots of people are also getting in touch, pointing out that there are, you know, the vast majority of people with mental illness are not a risk to anybody uh, at all. Perhaps more risk to themselves than certainly anybody else. We need to make that clear. But we don't need to import people. And once someone we decide, discover is someone who is a, a potential threat to other people with a history of violence, why are they still in this country, people would be asking. And it's a very fair and, and right question. I think, as I say, you know, if you're not a British citizen, being allowed to live in this country is a privilege and not a right. And I do think that the first duty of government, of um, anybody uh, in, in that space, is to protect British citizens first and foremost. Um, we have that debate uh, on a regular basis around migration at the minute. Um, uh, you know, there's no indication that um, this chap was um, not meant to be here or not allowed to be here in the first instance. He, he's had a legal right to, to stay. But I do think that if you are convicted of violent crimes, then you should be removed full stop. Um, as you say, it shouldn't be for us to um, have to, to pay for other people's um, criminals from other countries, quite frankly. Yeah. But it does pose this. I also think, though, that in the immediate aftermath of this particular event, the most important thing in this 24-hour period and over the coming days is to allow people to grieve, to, to allow communities to try and knit some of this back together. And from my point of view, my role in this is to try and support people to, to yeah. get their heads around this and to, to you know, feel OK. Now, as I say, we don't know all the circumstances of this case. It's obviously a live police investigation, so we don't want to speculate too much. But from what's been reported, this man who's committed this heinous, terrible crime didn't have a history of, of violent crimes, right? So if he did, then what Ben Bradley was arguing there might have some relevance. But no, all we've told is that he had a history of mental health problems. So you, you, what does he want to do? Deport people because they've got mental health problems? It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, if he's, if he's arguing that if, if this person gets convicted, he should be deported. Okay, who, who knows? But that doesn't stop the tragedy, right? And, and so what he seems to be intimating towards is if only we deported more people when they'd had histories of, of violent crime, this wouldn't happen. But that's not the case here because this guy didn't have a history of violent crime. So what, 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 what does he want to do? James, I mean, obviously tragic circumstances, and I found that quite a sort of distasteful and awful conversation between Julie Hartley Brewer and the Tory MP. Yeah, it's, a, it's appalling circumstances, and, and actually, I mean, rare occasion, I suppose. But I mean, I thought what Suella Braverman was was completely appropriate uh, in terms of responding to it, and, and what you'd expect the Home Secretary to, to say in response to something like this. Uh, what you've just shown in that clip was something else again, in terms of, and you could see actually Ben Bradshaw that he'd kind of respond to a prompt from Julie Hart the Brewer about the situation with some you know, sort of smear, really. Let's call it that, a kind of smear uh, against migrants in Britain. Then immediately. We sort of backtrack and say, oh, well, actually, you know, um, really, we have to like keep away from uh, speculating and, and in this emotional moment and then go straight back onto the smear again. So presumably in his head, he realised that what he was doing was kind of out of order. And that is uh, out of order here. The other bit to throw in, by the way, is, is that there's a sort of, I mean, this is a you know, just stepping back from the immediate situation a bit, which is probably not a bad idea, is that the, there is a there is a kind of right wing eco ecosystem out there that, that starts to generate this kind of conversation. So, okay, the Home Secretary says this thing, and I think it was appropriate and, and, and respectful, and it, and it kind of recognises an ongoing investigation that speculation is bad. You then get on to talk radio where that kind of falls by the wayside. There's quite a lot of speculation. That then feeds into what a whole load of people, and you can see it online, who've been given a bit of a licence to jump around on this by things like what you just saw on talk radio, who, who have absolutely no compunction whatsoever about saying some really, really appalling things. And you can see how that 
starts to impact on, on, on wider politics here, that you end up with a conversation that is anything like this is completely inappropriate. And it's not something that a sitting MP from a party where the Home Secretary has basically said the right thing about no speculation, respect, you know, the people are grieving. This is a horrible, horrible uh, tragedy and a crime that's happened. No respect for that whatsoever. And instead just feeding into this peculiar sort of ecosystem of, of, of different bits of the right feeding off each other and coming out with more and more horrible uh, conclusions. I just think it's such an appalling thing to do is to, to go on the radio in that situation and just say misleading stuff, right? Because, it, I mean, I, I don't understand why that would be a sensible point unless you as the audience member were thinking, oh, this person uh, presumably, you know, if, if, for this to have any relevance, this person presumably uh, must have been found to have a history of, 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 of violence and that's not the case here. Let's wrap up. Um, James, thank you so much for joining me this evening. No worries. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Um, we'll be back tomorrow at 6 p.m. For now, you've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.